thank you for tuning into this sermon on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, where we're dealing with the topic of the second coming of Christ and when are the end times going to happen. Let's get into God's word. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of day. We are not of the light or of darkness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word. We pray that you would use it to your glory. We thank you for the clear teaching in the word of God. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, outpour upon us. Change us, we ask. In Jesus' good name, amen. I had a nice, unreliable automobile. It was a blue Chrysler Plymouth Acclaim. This is the newer version of the very famous Reliant K car made by Chrysler. This car left me stranded numerous places. Stranded on the way to work. Stranded on the 401 in Toronto. There were only two positive things about this vehicle is that I found the seats comfortable and this car was easy to put a canoe on and take it off if you were going canoeing. But it was a particular popular car with regards to thieves because it was very easy to steal and you could easily jump start it without a key. Basically all you had to do was pry off the ignition and use a screwdriver and start the car. Very easy. One morning I was leaving for work and realized our car, which we called the Blue Bomber, was no longer in the parking lot. So I thought maybe the landlord had made a mistake and he saw that car there and he didn't think it should have belonged there and he had towed it. So I asked him, dude, where's my car? He very boldly told me that if your car is not here, it's been stolen. You know that that car is actually very easy to steal, don't you? A few days passed and our car was actually found by the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor and I wish the car could tell me its adventures. This event created some very serious inconveniences for me. I did not have a car. We did not have a car. But if I had known at the time when the thieves were going to come and do this to my car, you could be rest assured I would have been awake. I could see my car from the apartment. I would have been awake and ready. But this is the ugly truth about those who are thieves. They don't write you a letter or send you a postcard in the mail saying, on this date, at this time, at this minute, at this hour, I'm going to steal your car. Thieves just don't have the habit of doing a pre-call service to you that tomorrow at this time we are going to steal your car and drive it around. They just don't do that. And this is what Paul is getting at here in this section about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. We do not know when the Lord Jesus will come. Just like we never know that when the thief is going to come and steal our stuff. Jesus was very clear about speaking about his second coming and Jesus himself did not know the date or the hour when he spoke Matthew 24. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Therefore, we must be sure and secure in our position in the Lord Jesus Christ because he will come again at a time when we least expect it like thieves come at a time when we least expect them to come. We are in the section that Paul is addressing the second coming of the Lord Jesus in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 
verses 13 to 5 verse 11. And because Paul had addressed this topic of the second coming of the Lord Jesus, we know they had concerns and even a poor understanding of the second coming of the Lord Jesus. People thought that the return of Christ was very soon, so they felt they didn't have to work and work with their hands. And as well, the Thessalonians thought that the people who had died before the second coming of the Lord Jesus, that their dead loved ones didn't share in the resurrection. Paul deals very clearly with both of these issues, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 18. And now Paul deals with the timing of the Lord Jesus. The second coming of Jesus has not happened yet. It still hasn't happened yet 2,000 years later. And Paul calls those Christians and us to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. And are you ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus? Or are you holding out for a deathbed conversion? Are you waiting to get older or until you get sick to get serious about the Lord Jesus? Are you waiting so you can have more fun here on earth and then get serious about the grace of Christ that is offered freely to you? Salvation through faith by the grace of Christ in Christ alone. I pray that these words from God can speak to you, that you see the desperate need to be ready now. And this morning we have three points. First, times and seasons in verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 2 to 3, we have a thief in the night. And 5, verse 4 to 5, we have a total change. So let's look at times and seasons in verse 1. He says, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers. As Paul deals with the Thessalonians' concerns here, he starts this new section out with the phrase, now concerning. Paul used this phrase back in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, but now concerning brotherly love to make a break from his teaching on sexual purity and abstaining from sexual immorality to the focus upon them loving. In 1 Corinthians, Paul uses this phrase, now concerning, to show that he is answering questions that the Corinthians have given him. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1 and 25, he says, now concerning, and he speaks about sexuality and marriage. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, he addresses the topic of idols, now concerning idols. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts. And 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, now concerning the collection. Paul here is dealing with this issue of times and seasons, and really these two Greek words mean the same thing. Sometimes they're translated times and dates. And of course, the times and seasons or times and dates that Paul is referring to here is the second coming of Jesus. Jesus actually addresses this topic before he ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. So when they had come together, they asked him, that's the disciples, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He, that is Jesus, said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Do you see what, as well, Paul calls these believers Christians? These Christians, he calls them brothers. And you also see him call them brothers in verses 4 of chapter 5. Paul is dealing with the second coming, the timing of the second coming, and he reminds them they belong to the family of God. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're able to experience through Jesus Christ that God is their Father. Because of Christ, you now belong to the people of God. You're no longer a foreigner without hope or God. You now belong to God. These Christians have received the grace of Christ and are now in unity and family with Paul the Apostle. They're no longer in darkness as Paul later talks about in verse 4 and 5 of chapter 5 but they're in the light of day. Do you notice how, Paul, how much Paul reminds them of this truth? We're brothers. Fourteen times he reminds them of their connection to the family of God. We're the family of God. You're my brother. You're my sister in the Lord. 
and how important is it for us in our union with Christ as we explore the return of Jesus, very, very important. He says, you have, you have no need to have anything written to you, he says. Paul claims they have no need to write to them about these times and seasons and the return of the Lord Jesus. We know that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy likely talked about the judgment of God, the second coming of Christ to these believers in, with, their, at, with their time at Thessalonica. We know that Paul often preached the judgment of God, and we see this in the book of Acts. He preaches the judgment of God to the political leader Felix. Hear what Acts 24 and verse 25 says, And he reasoned, that's Paul, about righteousness, holy living, self-control, and the coming judgment to Felix. Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. So we have our times and seasons, referring to the second coming of Christ. Now we hear about the timing, the particular timing of Jesus coming as a thief in the night, verses 2 and 3. He writes, For you yourselves are fully aware. These believers in Thessalonica are fully aware because they've been taught by Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And 1 Thessalonians, it's important to know things, and Paul makes numerous references that they already know things. For instance, these believers already knew the purity of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy coming to them. They knew that. And here Paul emphasizes they know, they're fully aware of the, this coming of the Lord and its timing, that it's like a thief. This congregation was not sleeping when Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy preached to them. They received the word of God with deep conviction. They treasured God's word. Hear what he says next, that the day of the Lord, and now Paul gets into the second coming of Jesus, referring to the day of the Lord. And here we need to define the day of the Lord as it really refers to the second coming of Jesus. The day of the Lord, the Lord is Jesus. When we look at the passages in the Old Testament, we really see two themes when the prophets mainly speak about the day of the Lord. It refers to two things. The day of the Lord is often described as judgment, and the day of the Lord is often described as a day of restoration and salvation. Let's look at the day of the Lord being judgment. We see in the book of Amos which speaks extensively about the day of the Lord being punishment upon those who rebel against God. He writes, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord! Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house, and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness? and not light and gloom with no brightness in it. They're speaking about the judgment of God that will come on the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord as well is salvation for the people of God. It's a day of judgment for those who have rejected the Lord, but it's a day of salvation. And we see this clearly in the book of Zechariah, which is a book that we don't talk about a whole lot, chapter 14. Zechariah 14 speaks about the restoration of the land and the people of God by the grace of God. Look at Zechariah 14, verse 8 and 9. On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one as his name is one. Go to verse 11 of Zechariah 14. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. There you see the restoration of God's people in the land. So this day is one of salvation and punishment, much like what Paul gets at in the book of 2 Thessalonians when he speaks about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is one of being gathered to Christ as well as being a day of judgment upon those who have rejected the Lord Jesus. Now let's look at this description of the day of the Lord. It will come like a thief in the night. 
this day will come like a thief and that is the crazy thing about the thief you never know when the thief is going to come because the thief almost never tweets at you that he's going to rip you off and steal your stuff in your house a thief never makes a youtube video how to break into your particular car and how to jump start your particular car and announces it to the world they just never do that thieves never make videos that they're going to steal your pocket change in the car your snowshoes your fishing gear thieves are not public about what they're going to do they're secretive so they can be a thief it's same with the day of the lord the second coming of jesus we do not know the the hour or the day although some people think they can know the year but Jesus is very clear on this topic about the timing of the coming of the Lord in Matthew 24 and 25. Here Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away so we will so will be the coming of the son of man think about the flood in genesis 6 to 8 only eight people were ready and prepared for that flood and they were in the ark just like the flood came upon many people who were not expecting it so will be the second coming of the lord jesus it will strike them as a thief and just to make sure jesus has made his point clear after that section. In 24, Matthew 24, verse 42 and 44, he says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We should all get the point here. We do not know the time that Jesus is going to come again. Therefore, we must take note, be ready, stay awake. We'll apply this more in the application section. Let's go to verse 3 of chapter 5. While people are saying, there's peace, there's security. This is the attitude of just relaxation and peace and security and not being concerned about anything. Certainly not concerned what the Lord is saying about you. It's the attitude that the Lord doesn't see, the Lord doesn't care. And even if the Lord was out there, He doesn't care about what I'm up to. This attitude is one of complete rejection against the Lord and His glory. And this points us back to many of the things that false prophets said in the Old Testament. People offering false hope to the people of God who are in complete rejection of God. Even Micah 3.5 says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, peace. That's what the false prophets were saying. You have peace. There's no consequences to your sin. We're even seeing this attitude in North America, but people are even going further. They reject the Lord's grace. They reject the word of the Lord, but they want you to do the same, and they seek to force you and even cancel you to reject the Lord and adopt their idea of love and political correctness. People in our culture are saying, peace and security, live in your sin. But there's none, meaning no peace and security for those who reject the Lord Jesus. Hear what Paul says next. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Peace and security they think is on their plate. But what is really going to happen? Sudden destruction will come, and they will not escape. Here we see about those who have been rejecting Jesus as their Lord, rejecting the demands of Christ for their life, rejecting His grace. They think they have nothing to worry about, but here it says they will experience destruction. They will not escape it. 
This word destruction is a word that is used many times in the Old Testament and the New to speak about the punishment of God upon sinners. This word is used to speak about the fate of the wicked. It's by no means a light topic. It's a very serious and sobering topic that after people die or if Jesus comes again, they will experience destruction from the Lord and they will not escape it. And Paul uses this word in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. He says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Eternal destruction. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Note that they won't escape this destruction. This again seals the fate of those who reject Jesus. Paul equates this coming destruction to that of labor pains. And Paul uses this labor pains for two main reasons. Number one, labor pains are painful, much like this destruction, it will be painful. Even more, the destruction will be even more than labor pains. I know some of you think, Oh, you haven't experienced labor pains. You're a man. Be rest assured. I saw what was going on when my daughter was born. It looked painful to me. Number two, as you really do not know when labor pains are going to come upon you, just like when my daughter was born, we didn't know that the baby was coming late. We wanted it early. We didn't know when those labor pains were coming. So you do not know when Jesus will come again. And remember, Paul wrote this before the time when there was no labor-inducing drugs. So this destruction, they will not escape. It will be seriously painful, and they don't know when it will come. So we have times and seasons, thief in the night. Now Paul speaks about the total change. He writes, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief these Christians and these Thessalonians who are brothers are not in darkness. Although Paul does not elaborate on this truth much in this section, we know that Paul speaks about this light and darkness numerous times in his letters. For instance, in Ephesians, but as well, Colossians 1, 12-13, he writes, Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Darkness in our sinful state because of sin is what the darkness is that Paul is referring to here. If you're outside of the Lord Jesus, if you're not following the Lord, if you've not received His grace, you're in darkness. You're outside the grace and still in the darkness of your sin. But Christ, by means of his work upon the cross, deals with our darkness and sin. Jesus bears the darkness of our sin in our place by means of his work upon the cross. Jesus bears the curse of the punishment of God. And we're delivered from such darkness, from the sin and the punishment of our sin. Because we belong to Jesus, we are now in the light. We are children of light. We don't say to ourselves peace and security. We say to ourselves because of Christ. Jesus is our peace and security and our light and is the light of the world. And now he says the positive. You're not of darkness. He says in 5 verse 5, For you are all you are. That's who they are. Children of light. Children of day. We are not of the night nor, nor, or of the darkness. Paul makes a positive statement about those in Christ, those who are in Jesus Christ, those who have received His grace, His work, belong to the day, belong to the light. Again, only Jesus can give us this light. Hear what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Our eyes are blinded by sin and Satan and we're in darkness. But God speaks to that darkness. He shines his light into darkness. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. 
we cannot turn on that switch. This is not a light switch. Jesus shines this light into our darkness. Praise the Lord. It's his grace, his work upon the cross. Now we can come to our application. Christian, how do you get ready for the coming of Jesus? And maybe you're outside of Jesus this morning and watching this and disturbed by what's going on in the world. How do you get ready for the second coming of Jesus? Christian, how do you get ready? This may seem like a crazy question because if you're in Christian, it means you're in Christ. If you've received the grace of Christ, you're ready for the coming of Jesus already. There's nothing you can do to make you more light. Christ Jesus has made you light by his grace. And if you belong to Christ, there's great joy that awaits for you. Like Paul has previously said, those who are brought, uh, those in Christ will be brought with the Lord forever. Those in Christ will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 14 and 17. All this depends upon God and his calling, his perfect love, and the grace of Christ given to people who don't deserve it. You can't reach your way to heaven. There's no stairway to heaven. And don't even think of trying to buy a pass on that stairway to heaven. It doesn't get you there. The grace of God is given through Jesus Christ. It's the only way we can be ready, receiving his grace. When you go before God at your death, or at the second coming, the only person who can take you to heaven is Christ. Why would God let you into heaven? Because of Christ alone, his work on the cross. He called me, he saved me, I've received his grace through faith. It's Christ alone and his wonderful grace. But our response to this grace, and what flows out of the grace given to us, God calls us because of his grace and he commands us to be sober and to be ready. Jesus speaks about this readiness much in Matthew 25, but even here how Peter speaks about it in his second letter. In 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13, the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, since all these things are going thus to be dissolved. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Peter calls us to holiness, meaning as God is holy, we're to be holy. And I'm convinced that we as a church in Canada, North America, we have not taken holiness, myself included, seriously enough. God is pure, there's no sin in him, but why do we tolerate so much sin in our lives, even in our churches? God, make us holy. Lord Jesus, purge us of this desire to sin. Change our hearts, our minds, our desires that we would act holy in thought, word, and deed, and desire. Do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But we are also called to godliness. To put on the characteristics of godliness. We're called to put on love, patience, gentleness, self-control, humility. Most of these godly characteristics aren't even recognized in our society. But godliness is to be put on and we're transformed by the Holy Spirit and His Word. During these times of COVID, we've been given extra time. Please take that time to get into God's Word be renewed in your mind, be transformed by the grace of Christ through the word of God and be prepared for Christ's coming. Now, non-Christian, those of you who are outside of Jesus, those of you who are not serving Jesus, how do you get ready for the coming of Jesus? You might be thinking, well, I'm waiting for a deathbed conversion. Don't let that be your life. Many people think they'll wait to get serious for the Lord Jesus when they get cancer or they get a heart attack. Don't play with fire. For if you get a heart attack, you might not even come out of that. And even with COVID now, not to fear anybody, many people, several people, have died from COVID in this area. Today, don't wait any longer for that deathbed conversion or wait till you get sick to take the grace of Christ seriously. This passage teaches that Jesus will come like a thief. I've had numerous things stolen from me, money, car, 
Garden supplies, snowshoes, other stuff. I never knew when those criminals were coming. If I had known, I would have stopped. I would have been ready. I would have had the cops there. Just like you nor I know when Jesus is coming. So no longer think in your heart, I have peace and security apart from Christ. You don't. Only Jesus is your peace and security from the destruction of your sin from a holy God. Only Jesus gives this peace and security from the wrath of God which we all deserve. Hear this promise a few verses later. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9-10 For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. We can only receive this peace and security, this salvation from Christ. Receive His grace. Come to Him now. Come to this gracious Savior. Receive His mercy. Receive Christ. Embrace Christ. Change your mind about sin. And see Jesus as your all in all, your greatest treasure. Amen.